record featuring the old ad jingle, for the lady, for the child, everyone can find his style. But they did leave a total of 43 classical records, from Bach to Pfitzner, including half of Lohengrin, and the cover that Anatole had broken, which we gratefully toss into the stove. It's already evening. I'm sitting on the window seat, writing. Outside it's summer. The maple is dark green. The street has been swept clean and is empty. I'm making use of the last bit of daylight since we have to save on candles. No one's going to bring us any new ones. So now it's over. No more liquor, sugar, butter, meat. If only we could get to our potatoes. But as of yet no one dares dismantle the basement barricade. We're not sure they won't be coming back or sending new troops in. The widow preaches one sermon after the other, although not about the lilies in the field, which would be the only apt example for us. She's spinning more gloom and doom, sees us all starving to death. When I ask for a second helping of pea soup, she exchanges glances with Herr Pauli. Anti-aircraft fire is rattling my writing. People say they're practicing for a victory parade. The Americans are supposed to be there as well. It's entirely possible. Let them get on with their celebrations. They don't concern us. We've surrendered. Nevertheless, I do feel a new desire for life. Moving along. Now I'm writing at night, by candlelight, with a compress on my forehead. Around 8pm, someone pounded on our front door, crying, Fire! Fire! We ran outside, where everything was lit up and glaring bright. Flames were shooting out of the ruined basement two houses down the street, licking at the firewall of the neighbouring house, which was still intact. Acrid smoke came streaming out of a hole in the ruins and creeping up the street. The block was swarming with shadows, civilians, shouts and cries. What to do? There's no water. The superheated air was blasting out of the basement like a searing wind, exactly as during the nighttime air raids, which is why no one got very excited. Smother it, people said. Let's cover it with rubble. In no time we'd formed two chains. People passed chunks of stone from hand to hand, and the last person tossed them into the flames. Someone called out to hurry. It was already nine, and all civilians had to be off the streets by ten. A few figures rolled a barrel of liquid over from somewhere. We used buckets to scoop out the smelly stuff. In passing me a bucket, one woman accidentally hit my temple with the metal rim. My head spinning, I staggered over to a mound of stone on the grass across from me, the circular patch with all the graves, and sat down. A woman sat down next to me and told me in a monotone that the people under here were an officer and his wife who took cyanide. I knew that already, but I let her talk. No coffin, nothing, she said. They were simply wrapped in blackout paper tied up with string. They didn't even have sheets on their beds. They'd just been relocated here when their own place was bombed. But they must have had the poison ready. I felt dizzy. I could literally feel the bruise swelling on my forehead. The fire was soon contained and smothered. I joined a group of people and at first couldn't understand why they were cursing the owner of the delicatessen in the ruined building. Then I learned the man had left some of his wine stores in the basement, which was partially intact. The Russians discovered the alcohol, or perhaps I should say they sniffed it out, and cleared it off the shelves, candles in hand. By accident a spark must have landed in some of the straw used for wrapping the bottles, and that eventually led to the fire. According to one witness, the boys were lying dead drunk in the gutter. With my own eyes, I saw one of them who was still able to stand in his boots go down the row, pulling watches off his comrade's arms. General laughter. Now I'm lying in bed, writing, cooling my bruise. For tomorrow, we're planning a trip all the way across Berlin to the Schoenberg district. Thursday, 10th of May, 1945. The morning went by with housework, breaking wood, fetching water. The widow soaked her feet in water with baking soda, 
after trying out various hairstyles to find the one that shows as little grey as possible. Finally, at 3pm, we were ready to set off on our first tour of the conquered city. Poor words. You do not suffice. We clambered past the cemetery in the Hasenheider Park, long uniform rows of graves in the yellow sand from the last big air raid in March. The summer sun was scorching. The park itself was desolate. Our own troops had felled all the trees to have a clear field for shooting. The ground was scored with trenches, strewn with rags, bottles, cans, wires, ammunition. Two Russians were sitting beside a girl on a bench. It's rare to see one on his own. They probably feel safer in twos. We went on, through what were once heavily populated working-class streets. Now they seem so mute, the houses locked up and shut off from the world. You would think the ten thousand people who lived there had emigrated, or were dead. No sound of man or beast, no car, radio or tram. Nothing but an oppressive silence broken only by our footsteps. If there are people inside the buildings watching us, they are doing so in secret. We don't see any faces at the windows. Onward to the edge of the Schoenberg district. We'll soon find out whether we can continue, whether any of the bridges leading west over the S-Bahn survived intact. Some of the buildings have red flags, the first we've seen. Actually, they're more like flaglets, evidently cut from old Nazi flags. Here and there you can still make out the line of a circle where the white field containing the black swastika used to be. The little flags are neatly hemmed, undoubtedly by women's hands. How could it be otherwise in our country? All along the way we see debris left by the troops, gutted cars, burnt-out tanks, battered gun carriages. Occasional posters in Russian celebrating May Day, Stalin, the victory. Here, too, there are scarcely any people. Now and then some pitiful creature darts by, a man in shirt sleeves, a woman with dishevelled hair. No one pays us much attention. A woman passes us, barefoot and bedraggled. She answers our question, yes, the bridge is still there, and hurries away. Barefoot? In Berlin? I've never seen a woman in that condition before. The bridge is still blocked by a barricade of rubble. My heart is pounding as we slip through a gap. Glaring sun. The bridge is deserted. We pause to look down at the railroad embankment, a jumble of tracks, straw-coloured in the sunlight, pockmarked with craters one yard deep. Pieces of rail wrenched high above the ground, upholstery and scraps of fabric streaming out of bombed sleepers and dining cars. The heat is stifling. The smell of fire hangs over the tracks. All around is desolation. A wasteland. Not a breath of life. This is the carcass of Berlin. On into Schoenberg. Here and there we see people in the doorways. A woman, a girl, their blank eyes staring into space, their features vapid and bloated. I can tell by looking that the war has only recently ended here. They still haven't recovered from the shock. They are still as numb as we were several days back. We head down Potsdamer Strasse, past blackened offices, empty tenements, heaps of rubble. A moving sight on one corner. Two rickety old women standing in front of a pile of rubble so huge it towers above them. They scratch at the refuse with a small shovel, load it onto a little cart. At that rate it will take them weeks to move the entire mountain. Their hands are knobby and gnarled. But perhaps they'll finish the job. Kleist Park is a wasteland with masses of rags, mattresses and cushions torn from cars lying under the arcades and piles of feces everywhere, swarming with flies. Right in the middle stands the half-finished high-rise bunker, like a hedgehog surrounded by iron spikes that was intended to shelter us from bombs in the seventh year of the war. Two civilians are yanking away at a stack of beams, one of them sawing the timbers into more manageable pieces. Everything belongs to everyone. The saw cuts through the silence with its pitiful rasp. Reflexively, 
the widow and I drop our voices to a whisper. Our throats are parched. The dead city has taken our breath away. The air in the park is full of dust. All the trees are covered in white powder, riddled with bullet holes, badly wounded. A German shadow hurries past with a load of bedding. At the other end of the park we find a Russian grave surrounded by wire. Another set of gaudy, red wooden uprights. And in the middle, a flat granite slab bearing an inscription in lime paint. Here rest heroes who fell for the fatherland. The Russian word for hero is garoi. It sounds so Prussian. Twenty minutes later, we are in front of the house where the widow's friends live. He was in the same brotherhood as my husband, she says of the man, a lecturer in classical literature. The building looks completely dead, the front door boarded up with slats. As we search for the back entrance, we run into a woman who has lifted her skirt and is taking care of her needs in the corner of the courtyard, completely unembarrassed. I've never seen that in Berlin before, either, not so publicly. Finally, we find the entrance, climb the two flights of stairs, knock and shout the widow's name as a password. Noises inside, steps and whispers, until they finally realised who it is. The door flies open. We embrace. I press my face against that of a stranger. After all, I've never seen these people before. First the wife, then her husband emerges, holding his hands out to us, asking us inside. The widow talks as if in a fever, her words are jumble. The other woman is talking as well, and neither is listening. It takes a while before we are seated in the apartment's one inhabitable but very draughty room. We fish out the butter sandwiches we've brought along and offer them to the widow's friends. They're both amazed. They haven't seen any bread, and the Russians didn't leave any behind. In answer to the standard question, how often did they... The lady of the house answers with a broad East Prussian accent. Me. Only once, the first day. After that, we locked ourselves down in the basement. We had a wash boiler full of water. The conquerors reached the neighbourhood later and left earlier. Everything happened in a flash. What are they living off? We still have a sack of groats and a few potatoes. Oh, and our horse, too. Horse? They laugh, and the woman explains with graphic gestures. While the German soldiers still controlled the street, someone came running into the basement with the good news that a horse had been killed, and in no time people were outside. The animal was still twitching and rolling its eyes as the first bread knives and pen knives plunged into its body, all under fire, of course. Everyone sliced and dug at the first spot they found. When the classicist's wife reached over towards some shimmering layers of yellow fat, someone wrapped a knife handle across her fingers and said, You, stick to your own place. She managed to hack out a six-pound piece of meat. We used the last of it to celebrate my birthday, she told us. It tasted excellent. I had pickled it in what vinegar I had left. We wished her many happy returns. A bottle of Bordeaux appeared. We drank, raising our glasses to the wife. The widow talked about how she compares with a Ukrainian woman. We have lost all sense of moderation. We said goodbye over and over. The classicist rummaged about the room, searching for something he could give us in exchange for the bread, but didn't find anything. Then we moved on to the next district, the Bayerisches Viertel, to look in on my friend Gisela. The streets were blocked with row after row of German automobiles, practically every one of them gutted. One barber had reopened his shop. A piece of paper advertised that he cut men's hair and washed women's if they brought their own warm water. We actually saw a customer in the half-dark, and a man jumping around with a pair of scissors. The first sign of life in the city carcass. Up the stairs to Giesler's. I knocked and called out, shaking with excitement. Once again we pressed our cheeks together, though the most we ever used to do was give each other's hand a firm squeeze. Giesler was not alone. She's taken in two young girls, students sent by an acquaintance, refugees from Breslau. They sat mutely in a nearly empty room that had no window panes, but nevertheless clean. 
After the first eager exchanges, a lull settled in the conversation. I could sense suffering in the air. Both young girls had black circles under their eyes. What they said sounded so hopeless, so bitter. At one point Gisela led me out to the balcony and whispered that both of them had been deflowered by the Russians. They'd had to withstand repeated rapes. Hertha, a blonde of twenty, had been having pains ever since and doesn't know what to do. She cries a great deal, according to Gisela. There's no word from her family. From Silesia, they were scattered to the winds. Who knows if they're still alive? She clings to Gisela hysterically. The other one, delicate Brigitte, is nineteen and defends herself psychologically with an angry cynicism. She's brimming with gall and hate. Life is filthy and all men are swine. She wants to go away, far away, some place where she won't see that uniform, the mere sight of which makes her heart lose a beat. Gisela herself came through unscathed, using a trick I learned about too late, unfortunately. Before she came an editor, she had had ambitions to be an actress, and had taken courses in which she learned a little about stage makeup. In the basement, she painted a wonderful old lady's mask on her face and tucked her hair under a handkerchief. When the Russians came in and spotted the two young students with their flashlights, they pushed Gisela, charcoal wrinkles and all, back onto her bedding. You, babushka, sleep. I couldn't help laughing, but I immediately had to rein in my merriment. The two girls looked too glum, too bitter. End of Side 5 Side 6 These girls have been forever deprived of love's first fruits. Whoever begins with the last phase and in such a wicked way can no longer quiver with excitement at the very first touch. There's one boy I'm thinking of. Paul was his name. He was seventeen, just like me, when he pushed me into the shadows of an unfamiliar entranceway on Ullmannstrasse. We'd been to a school concert, Schubert, I think, and were still warmed by the music, though we had no idea what to say about it. Both of us were inexperienced, teeth pressed against teeth, and I waited faithfully for the wonder you're supposed to feel when you kiss, until I realised that my hair had come undone, the hair slide I used to keep it up was gone. In a panic, I shook out my dress and collar. Paul felt around in the dark on the pavement. I helped him, and our hands met and touched, but no longer with any warmth. We didn't find the hair slide. I had probably lost it on the way. That was very annoying, as my mother would notice right away, ask me what had happened, give me stern looks. And surely my face would betray what Paul and I had done in the entranceway. We parted in a hurry, suddenly at a loss, and never drew close to each other again. Even so, those shy minutes in the shadows have always kept their silver sheen. We stayed at Giesler's an hour and spent a long time saying goodbye. These days it's so hard to separate from your friends. You never know whether and how you'll see one another again. So much can happen. Nonetheless, I invited Gisela to visit us the next day. The widow had invited her friends as well. We want to see that they get a crust of bread. Back home, the same desolate, long, dusty way. It turned out that the trip really was too much for the widow. Her feet were aching and we had to make frequent stops to rest on the curb. I trudged along as if under a heavy load the burdensome feeling that Berlin might never rise again, that we would remain rats in the rubble for the rest of our lives. For the first time, I entertained the thought of leaving this city, of looking for bread and shelter elsewhere, some place where there's air and open countryside. In the park we rested on a bench. A young woman sitting next to us was taking a walk with two small boys. A Russian came by and waved his inevitable companion over, saying to him in Russian, Come here, there are some children. They're the only ones you can talk to in this place. The mother glanced at us, anxious, and shrugged her shoulders. Sure enough, a conversation developed between the men and the two little boys, whom the soldiers took on their knees and bounced to a Russian song. Then one of the soldiers turned to me and said, in the friendliest tone in the world, in Russian, it's all the same who sleeps with you. A cock's a cock. 
I'd learned that expression in all its country boy crudeness from Anatole. I had to strain to keep up my act of not understanding what he was saying, since that was what he was counting on. So I just smiled, which made the two men roar with laughter. As you please. Home with tired feet, Herr Pauli had posted himself in an armchair next to the window and was keeping an eye out for us. He refused to believe that in three hours of trekking about we'd run into only a few wandering Russians. He'd imagined the centre of town would be abuzz with troops. After the fact, we were surprised ourselves and wondered where all the victors might have gone. We gulped down the clean air of our corner, still shuddering at the thought of the dusty wasteland in Schoenberg. I'm having a hard time falling asleep. Grim thoughts. A sad day. Friday, 11th of May, 1945. Housework. We soaked our laundry, peeled the last potatoes from our kitchen stores. Fräulein Bain brought us our new ration cards, printed in German and Russian on newsprint. There's one type for adults and one for children under 14. I have my card right here beside me and am making a note of the daily ration. 200 grams of bread, 400 grams of potatoes, 10 grams of sugar, 10 grams of salt, 2 grams of coffee substitute, 25 grams of meat. No fats. If they really give us all that, it will be quite something. I'm amazed even this much order has been brought out of the chaos. When I saw a queue in front of the greengrocers, I took my place and used our coupons to get some beetroot and dried potatoes. You hear the same talk in the queue as at the pump. Everyone is now turning their backs on Adolf. No one was ever a supporter. Everyone was persecuted and no one denounced anyone else. What about me? Was I for or against? What's clear is that I was there, that I breathed what was in the air, and it affected all of us, even if we didn't want it to. Paris proved that to me, or rather a young student I met in the Jardin du Luxembourg, three years after Hitler came to power. We had taken shelter from a sudden shower under a tree. We spoke French and recognised right away that it was a foreign language for both of us. Then we had fun bantering back and forth, guessing where the other was from. My hair led him to place me as a Swede, while I pegged him as a Monegasque. I'd just learned what citizens of Monaco are called and found the name amusing. The rain stopped as abruptly as it had begun. We set off, and I gave a little skip, so I'd be walking in step with him. He stopped and proclaimed, Aha! Un fille du Führer! A daughter of Hitler, in other words, a German, unmasked the minute she tried to march in perfect step with her neighbour. So much for fun and banter. But then the young man introduced himself not as a monogasque, but as a Dutchman and a Jew. And that was the end of our conversation. We went our separate ways at the next fork in the path. The experience left a bitter taste. I brooded over it for a long time. I realised it had been ages since I heard about Herr and Frau Goltz, my neighbours from my earlier building that burned down, who used to be faithful party followers. I went the few buildings' distance to find out. It took forever before their neighbours finally cracked open the door, keeping it on the chain, and told me that Herr and Frau Goltz had stolen away unnoticed, and how that was a good thing, since some Russians had been by looking for him. Evidently he'd been denounced. Late in the afternoon, someone knocked on our door, calling for me. I was amazed to see one of the figures, now practically forgotten, from our basement past. Sigismund, believer in victory, who'd heard from somewhere that I had connections to higher Russians. He wanted to know if it was true that all former party members had to report voluntarily for work or else risk being lined up against a wall and shot. There are so many rumours flying about, it's impossible to keep up with all of them. I told him that I didn't know anything, and didn't think anything like that was planned, that he should wait and see. 
it was almost impossible to recognise the man. His pants were billowing loosely around his emaciated body. His whole person looked miserable and crumpled. The widow gave him a sermon about the dangers of fellow travelling, how he surely sees for himself what that can lead to. Sigismund, I still don't know his real name, swallowed it all meekly, then asked for a piece of bread. And he was given one too, which caused a family row as soon as he left. Herr Pauli fumed and shouted that it was outrageous for the widow to give that man something. After all, he was responsible for the whole mess, and the worse off he was now, the better. They ought to lock him up and take away his ration cards. Pauli himself was always against. He has a contrary character. Dissenting, negating, a Mephistophelian spirit that always denies. From what I've seen, there's nothing on earth he's in complete and unreserved agreement with. At any rate, no one wants to hear another word about Sigismund, and the man doesn't dare show himself in the house. Everyone would give him a tongue lashing. No one wants to have anything to do with him, especially not those in the same boat. He must find it all bleak as well as baffling. I also gave him a piece of my mind, which bothers me right now. Does that mean that I, too, am following the mob? From Hosanna to crucify him? The eternal refrain. Half an hour ago, in the evening twilight, sudden shots. Far off a woman's scream. We didn't even look out of the window. What for? But reminders like that aren't a bad thing. They keep us alert. Saturday, 12th of May, 1945. This morning the entire community of tenants, as we are again officially called, gathered in the back garden, which I had at one point pictured as a cemetery. We were there to dig all right, but only a pit for the building's garbage, which was towering over the bins. People were eager to work and had funny things to say. Everyone felt relieved, happy to be able to do something useful. It's so strange that no one has to go to work anymore that we're all on a kind of leave, that the married couples are with each other from dawn to dusk. After that I mopped the living room, scrubbed away all the Russian spittle and boot polish, and swept the last crumbs of horse manure off the floor. That left me good and hungry. We still have peas and flour. The widow has rendered what she could from the rancid leftovers of Herr Pauli's Volkstorm butter, and uses it as fat. The apartment was sparkling when our guests arrived from Schoenberg. They'd come together, even though Gisela had never met the widow's friends. All three were cleaned up, neatly dressed, and their hair nicely done. They took the same route we did, and saw the same thing. That is, hardly anyone except the occasional Russian, only silence and desolation. We showed them lavish hospitality, thin coffee and bread with a little fat for all of them. I took Gisela into the living room for a chat. I wanted to know what she was thinking of doing. Her predictions were dire. She sees her world, the Western world steeped in art and culture, as disappearing, and it's the only world she finds worthy. She feels she's too tired to start all over. She doesn't think that a discriminating individual would have any room to breathe, let alone do any kind of intellectual work. No, she's not thinking of taking Veronel or some other poison. She intends to stick it out, even if she has little courage and less joy. She spoke of trying to find the divine within her soul, wanting to be reconciled with her innermost self and finding salvation there. She's undernourished, has dark shadows under her eyes, and will have to go on being hungry, along with the two girls she's taken in, whom I think she's feeding out of her own portion. Her small store of peas and beans and oats was stolen from her basement by Germans before the Russians invaded. Homo homini lupus. Man is a wolf to man. As she left, I gave her two cigars that I quietly lifted from the Major's box, which Herr Pauli had already half consumed. After all, I'm the one responsible for that gift, not Pauli. I deserve my share. Gisela can trade them for something to eat. In the evening I went to get water. Our pump is a fine piece of work. 
The shaft is broken, and the lever, which has come undone many times, has been lashed on cumbersomely with yards of wire and string. Three people have to hold the structure up while two pump. This collective effort is now taken for granted. No one says a thing. Afterwards, both my buckets are full of floating splinters and shavings from the pump. We have to strain the water. I'm once again amazed at the fact that they went to such efforts to build barricades that proved useless, but didn't give the slightest thought to ensuring we had a few decent water stations for the siege. After all, they put cities to siege, so they had to have known. Probably anyone in a position of power who talked about pump construction would have been dismissed as a defeatist and a scoundrel. A quiet evening. For the first time in three weeks, opened a book. Joseph Conrad, The Shadow Line. But I had a hard time finding my way into it. I'm too full of images myself. Sunday, 13th of May, 1945. A glorious summer day. Noises first thing in the morning. An optimistic clamour of beating rugs, scrubbing, hammering. Still there's apprehension in the air, a looming fear that we'll have to hand our apartments over to the military. The rumour at the pump was that troops will be billeted on our block. Nothing in this country belongs to us any more, nothing but the moment at hand, and all three of us chose to enjoy that by sitting down to a richly spread breakfast table, Herr Pauli still in his robe, but already halfway healthy again. Bells are ringing all over Berlin to celebrate the Allied triumph. Somewhere right now the famous parade is underway, a parade that doesn't concern us at all. They say that the Russians have a holiday, that the troops have been given vodka to celebrate the victory. The word at the pump is that women should do what they can not to leave home. We don't know whether to believe it or not. The widow shakes her head uneasily. Herr Pauli is again rubbing the small of his back, says he should lie down. I'll wait and see. As it is, the subject of alcohol has been much on our minds. Herr Pauli heard about an order issued to retreating German soldiers to leave all liquor stores intact for the advancing enemy. Experience shows that alcohol impairs the enemy's strength to fight and slows their advance. Now that's something only men could cook up for other men. If they just thought about it for two minutes, they'd realise that liquor greatly intensifies the sexual urge. I'm convinced that if the Russians hadn't found so much alcohol all over, Half as many rapes would have taken place. These men aren't natural Casanovas. They had to goad themselves on to such brazen acts, had to drown their inhibitions. And they knew it, too, or at least suspected as much. Otherwise they wouldn't have been so desperate for alcohol. Next time there's a war fought in the presence of women and children, for whose protection men supposedly used to do their fighting out on the battlefield, away from home, Every last drop of drink should be poured into the gutter, wine stores destroyed, beer cellars blown up, or else let the defenders have their final spree, as far as I'm concerned. Just make sure there's no alcohol left, as long as there are women within grabbing distance of the enemy. Onward. It's now evening. The much-feared Sunday is over. Nothing happened. It was the most peaceful Sunday since the 3rd of September, 1939. I lay on the sofa. Outside was full of sun and twittering birds. I nibbled on some cake the widow baked, using a sinful amount of wood, and took an accounting of my life. Here's the balance. On the one hand, things are looking pretty good for me. I'm healthy and refreshed. Nothing has harmed me physically. I feel extremely well armed for life, as if I had webbed feet for the mud, as if my fibre were especially supple and strong. I'm well equipped for the world. I'm not delicate. My grandmother used to haul manure. On the other hand, there are multiple minuses. I don't know what in the world I should do. No one really needs me. I'm simply floating, waiting, with neither goal nor task in sight. I can't 
help thinking of a debate I once had with a very smart Swiss woman, in which I countered every scheme for improving the world by insisting that the sum total of tears always stays the same, i.e. that in every nation of the world, no matter what flag or system of government, no matter which gods are worshipped or what the average income is, the sum total of tears, pain and fear that every person must pay for his existence is a constant, and so the balance is maintained. Well-fed nations wallow in neuroses and excesses, while people plagued with suffering, as we are now, may rely on numbness and apathy to help see them through. If not for that, I'd be weeping morning, noon and night. But I'm not crying, and neither is anyone else, and the fact that we aren't is all part of a natural law. Of course, if you believe that the earthly sum of tears is fixed and immutable, then you're not very well cut out to improve the world or to act on any kind of grand scale. To summarise, I've been in twelve European countries. I've seen Moscow, Paris and London, among other cities, and experienced Bolshevism, parliamentarianism and fascism close up, as an ordinary person, among ordinary people. Are there differences? Yes, substantial ones. But from what I can tell, these distinctions are mostly ones of form and coloration, of the rules of play, not differences in the greater or lesser fortunes of the common people, which Candide was so concerned about. And the individuals I encountered who were meek, subservient, and utterly uninterested in any existence other than the one they were born to, didn't seem any unhappier in Moscow than they did in Paris or Berlin. All of them lived by adjusting their souls to the prevailing conditions. No, my current gauge, an utterly subjective one. Personal taste. I simply wouldn't want to live in Moscow. What oppressed me most there was the relentless ideological schooling, the fact that people were not allowed to travel freely, and the absolute lack of any erotic aura. The way of life just wouldn't suit me. On the other hand, I'd be happy in Paris or London, although there I've always had the painfully clear feeling of not belonging, of being a foreigner, someone who is merely tolerated. It was my own choice to return to Germany, even though friends advised me to emigrate. And it was good I came home, because I could never have put down roots elsewhere. I feel that I belong to my people, that I want to share their fate, even now. But how? When I was young, the red flag seemed like such a bright beacon. But there's no way back to that now. Not for me. The sum of tears is constant in Moscow, too. And I long ago lost my childhood piety, so that God and the beyond have become mere symbols and abstractions. Should I believe in progress? Yes, to bigger and better bombs. The happiness of the greater number. Yes, for Petka and his ilk. An idyll in a quiet corner. Sure, for people who comb out the fringes of their rugs. Possessions? Contentment? I have to keep from laughing, homeless urban nomad that I am. Love? Lies trampled on the ground. And were it ever to rise again, I would always be anxious I could never find true refuge, would never again dare hope for permanence. Perhaps art, toiling away in the service of form. Yes, for those who have the calling, but I don't. I'm just an ordinary labourer. I have to be satisfied with that. All I can do is touch my small circle and be a good friend. What's left is just to wait for the end. Still, the dark and amazing adventure of life beckons. I'll stick around out of curiosity. And because I enjoy breathing and stretching my healthy limbs. Monday, 14th of May, 1945. Last night, the noise of motors tore me from my sleep. Hearing shouts and honking, I stumbled to the window, and lo and behold, 
there was a Russian truck full of flour. The baker already has coal, so now he'll be able to bake to accommodate the ration cards and numbers. I heard him shout for joy and saw him hugging the Russian driver, who was also beaming. The Russians enjoy playing Santa Claus. Then this morning at dawn I was awakened by the sound of chattering people, queuing for bread. The line wound halfway round the block, and it's still there now in the afternoon. Many women have brought stools along. I can literally hear the hiss of gossip. For the first time we have water from a proper hydrant, not far away at all. It's a mechanical wonder, an automatic pump with three taps that deliver the water in a thick stream. Your bucket is filled in a flash, and you don't need to wait more than a few minutes. That really changes our day, making our lives easier. On the way to the hydrant I passed a number of graves. Practically every front garden has these silent billets. Some are marked with German steel helmets, some with the gaudy red Russian stakes and white Soviet stars. They must have hauled along whole trainloads of these memorials. Wooden plaques have been set up on the curbs with inscriptions in German and Russian. One of them quotes Stalin to the effect that the Hitlers disappear, but Germany remains. Losungi, that's the Russian word for such slogans, from the German Losung. Now a bulletin has been posted next to the door of our building. News for Germans. The last words sound so strange in this context, almost like an insult. You can read the text of our unconditional surrender, signed by Keitel, Stumpf, Friedeberg, along with reports of arms being surrendered on all fronts. Goering has been captured. One woman claims she heard on the crystal set that he cried like a child at his arrest and had already been sentenced to death by Hitler. A colossus with feet of clay. But there's another sheet posted up, which attracts far more attention and sparks more debate. Evidently the Russians are introducing new rationing regulations with larger allotments, but allocated according to group. Heavy labourers, blue-collar workers, white-collar workers, children and others. Bread, potatoes, concentrated foodstuffs, coffee substitute, real coffee, sugar, salt, even fat. Not so bad, if it's true. In some cases the rations are more generous than we had lately under Adolf. This information is making a profound impact. I hear people say things like, there's another example of how our propaganda made fools of us all. It's true, too. The constant forecasts of death by starvation, of complete physical annihilation by the enemy, were so pervasive that we're stunned by every piece of bread every indication that we will still be provided for. In that respect, Goebbels did a great advance job for the conquerors. Any crust of bread from their hands seems like a present to us. This afternoon I queued up for meat. There's nothing more instructive than spending an hour like that. I learned that trains are back up and running to Stettin, Kustrin and Frankfurt an der Oder. On the other hand, our local public transport is apparently still shut down. One woman enjoyed telling the story of why the Russians chose to leave their building alone. On their first brief visit, they found one family poisoned in their beds on the second floor, and another, one floor up, all hanging from the transom of the kitchen window. The Russians took off terrified and never came back, and the residents keep everything the way it was, as a kind of scarecrow, just in case. Anyway, I was able to get my meat without a hitch. All beef, no bones, that will help us out. Tenants meeting in the basement, 4.30pm. The word went from door to door. At last the basement barricade is being dismantled. A good thing, too. We'll be able to get to the rest of the widow's potatoes. We form a chain along the hallway. A small candle stuck onto a chair gave a faint glow as bricks, boards, chair and mattress parts passed from one hand to the next. The basement was a complete mess, the smell of excrement. Each person packed up his things. Unclaimed goods were supposed to be placed in the light well. Despite this, the widow let some silk underwear that didn't belong to her quietly vanish into her sack. Later she remembered the Ten Commandments and put the piece of clothing, which had an embroidered monogram indicating the rightful owner, back where it belonged, claiming she had taken it by mistake. 
But all notions of ownership have been completely demolished. Everyone steals from everyone else, because everyone has been stolen from, and because we can make use of anything. So the only unclaimed goods were ones not worth the taking, threadbare slips, hats, a single shoe. While the widow kept poking around bitterly for the pearl type-in, she'd forgotten where she hid it, I lugged the potatoes upstairs and dumped them next to Herr Pauli's bed. The widow followed me up and immediately started in like Cassandra, with warnings of how we'd starve to death as soon as we finished the last of their potatoes. Herr Pauli vigorously seconded everything she said. This makes me think that the household is beginning to view me as a burden, one more mouth to feed, that they're counting each morsel I consume and begrudging me every single potato. Meanwhile, Pauli is still happy to dip into my major's sugar. Nevertheless, I want to try to get back on my own feet, as far as food is concerned. Only how? I can't bring myself to be angry with the two of them. Not that I've had to, but it could well be that in their situation I wouldn't be too happy to share my food either. And there's no new major on the horizon. Tuesday, 15th of May, 1945 The usual tedious housework. Two roofers are stomping around in the attic apartment, which I entered for the first time since the Russians invaded. They're getting paid in bread and cigarettes. I can tell that the Russians never made it up here because the floors are covered with a fine layer of plaster dust that shows every footprint, and it was untouched when I let in the roofers. Presumably I could have held out up here, if I'd had enough water and food, an undisturbed sleeping beauty. But I'm sure I would have gone crazy, all alone like that. Once again, we all have to report to the rat house. Today was the day for people with my last initial. The street was unusually crowded at registration time. A man in the rat house lobby was chiselling away the relief of Adolf. I watched the nose come splintering off. What is stone? What are monuments? An iconoclastic wave such as we have never seen is currently surging through Germany. A new twilight of the gods. Is it remotely possible that the big Nazis could ever rise again after this? As soon as I've freed my mind a little, I really have to turn my attention to Napoleon. After all, he too was banished in his day, only to be brought back and glorified once more. We had to go up to the third floor and wait in line. The corridor was pitch dark, packed with women you could hear but not see. A conversation in front of me had to do with planting asparagus, a task several women had been assigned to do. That wouldn't be so bad. The two women behind me were well-bred ladies, judging from their speech. One said, You know, I was completely numb. I'm very small there. My husband always took that into consideration. Apparently she'd been raped repeatedly and attempted to poison herself. Then I heard her say, I didn't realise it at the time, but I later learned that your stomach has to have enough acid inside for the stuff to work. I couldn't keep it down. And now? The other asked quietly. Well, life goes on. The best part was over anyway. I'm just glad my husband didn't have to live through this. Once again I have to reflect on the consequences of being alone in the midst of adversity. In some ways it's easier not having to endure the torment of someone else's suffering. What must a mother feel seeing her girl devastated? Probably the same as anyone who truly loves another but either cannot help them or doesn't dare to. The men who've been married for many years seem to hold up best. They don't look back. Sooner or later their wives will call them to account, though. It must be bad for parents. I can understand why whole families would cling together in death. The registration was over in a flash. We all had to say which languages we know. When I confessed to my bit of Russian, I was given a paper requiring me to report tomorrow morning to Russian headquarters as an interpreter. I spent the evening preparing lists of words, and realised how paltry my command of the language really is. After that I ended my day with a visit to the lady from Hamburg downstairs. Stinchen, the eighteen-year-old student, has finally come down from the crawl space. The scars from the flying rubble have healed. She played the part of the well-bred daughter from a good home perfectly, carrying a pot of real tea from the kitchen 
and listening politely to our conversation. Apparently, our young girl who looks like a young man also managed to come through safely. I mentioned that I'd seen her in the stairwell last night. She was arguing with another girl, someone in a white sweater, tanned and quite pretty, but vulgar and unbridled in her swearing. Over tea, I found out that it was a jealous spat. The tanned girl had taken up with a Russian officer, in time more or less voluntarily, drinking with him and accepting food. This evidently irked her young friend, who is an altruistic kind of lover, constantly giving the other girl presents and doing this and that for her over the past several years. We discussed all of this calmly and offhandedly over a proper tea. No judgment, no verdict. We no longer whisper. We don't hesitate to use certain words, to voice certain things, certain ideas. They come out of our mouths casually, as if we were channeling them from Sirius. Wednesday, 16th of May, 1945 I got up at 7am, Moscow time. The streets were quiet with an early morning stillness. The shops were empty. The new cards have yet to be distributed. A girl in uniform was standing by the iron bar gate outside the headquarters. She didn't want to let me in, but I showed her my paper and insisted. At last I was sitting in the office of the Commandant, the present Lord and Master of at least a hundred thousand souls. A small, slender man, very much spit and polish, pale blonde, with a conspicuously quiet manner of speaking. Russian is his only language, but he has an interpreter at his side, a respectable woman in a check dress, not a soldier. Fast as the wind, she rattles away in German and Russian, translating between the commandant and a sharp-nosed woman, the owner of a cafe. The woman wants to reopen? Excellent. She should go ahead and do so. What does she need? Flour, sugar, fat, sausage. Mm-hmm. What does she have? Coffee substitute. Good. She should serve that, along with a little music, if possible. Perhaps set up a gramophone. The goal is for life to return to normal very soon. The Commandant promises that she should have power back tomorrow, along with the rest of her street. The interpreter summons a man from the next room, most likely an electrical engineer. He brings in some blueprints and shows the Commandant how power is being restored in the district. I crane my neck to look, but our block isn't there. More petitioners follow. A man in blue overalls, asks if he can take home a horse that's lying lame and bleeding in the park to nurse it back to health. Please, go ahead, as long as he knows something about horses. I'm secretly amazed that the horse hasn't been cut up into pot-sized pieces by now. Or have we seen the last of those days, when animals were slaughtered right where they fell? It's astonishing to see all these people suddenly so fixated on obtaining permits just so they can cover their backs for anything they want to do. Commandant is clearly the word of the day. A factory owner comes in with two stenotypists to register his small business, a stovepipe plant, temporarily closed due to lack of material. Boudet, says the Commandant. It will be. A magic Russian formula that the interpreter consolingly translate as Don't worry, there'll be new material coming in soon. Well, Boudet is certainly one of the words I can manage, along with the second magic formula Javtra. Tomorrow. Next come two men, apparently managers of a chocolate factory. They've brought along their own interpreter, someone at the same level as me. The man must have spent time in Russia as a soldier working there. Chocolate is still a long way off, of course, but the men want to bring some rye flour from a warehouse outside town and use it to make noodles. Go ahead. The commandant promises them a truck for Zaptra. The atmosphere is very matter-of-fact, no stamps, and very few papers. The Commandant works with small scribbled notes. I am all eyes and ears watching the authorities in action. It's fun and exciting to observe. Finally, it's my turn. I jump right in and brazenly confess the obvious, namely that my Russian isn't up to the complex task of interpretation. In a friendly way, he asks where I learned Russian, what I studied. Then he says he's sure that in the foreseeable future there'll be a need for people trained in drawing and photography, that I should wait. That's fine with me. Meanwhile, two Russians have come in, boots gleaming, their freshly pressed uniforms richly decorated. 
Being washed and groomed is a mark of cultura for them, a sign of a higher level of humanity. I still remember all the posters I saw hanging in offices and trams throughout Moscow. Wash your face and hands every day, and your hair at least once a month, with cute little illustrations of splashing and blowing and rinsing in wash basins. A religion of cleanliness. Polished boots are also part of the same cultura, so I'm not surprised by how eager the men are to shine them up whenever possible. The two men whisper with the commandant. Finally, he turns to me and asks whether I could accompany sub-lieutenant so-and-so, ch 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 this time the name was clearly stated but I immediately forgot it, as an interpreter while he makes his rounds. He's been assigned to inspect the banks in the district. That's fine with me as well. I'm happy to do anything that isn't fetching water or scavenging for wood. So I traipse through the Berlin streets alongside the swarthy, good-looking officer. He talks to me slowly, careful to pronounce every word distinctly, the way you do with foreigners who barely speak your language, and explains that we first have to call on the district mayor, a German, to request a list of the various banks' branch offices. Burgemeister is the German word for mayor from the German Burgemeister. Crowds of people are milling about the rat house and running up and down the dim corridors. Men dash from room to room, doors bang open and shut. Somewhere a typewriter is rattling away. Identical handwritten notices have been posted on the few pillars that have a little light. A family is searching for a woman who lost her mind on the 27th of April and ran away. The person in question is 43 years of age, teeth in poor condition, hair dyed black and wearing slippers. In the mayor's office a swarm of men is buzzing around the desk talking and gesturing intently as an interpreter keeps chattering. Within minutes the sub-lieutenant is handed a list of the banks. A girl types out the addresses. The window seat is adorned with a bouquet of lilac. We set off. The lieutenant is reserved and very polite. He asks if he's going too quickly, if I know much about banking, if it really isn't a burden to accompany him. At the Dresdner Bank we find things in good order. Clean desks with pencils placed at right angles. The ledger books are open, all the safes intact. The entrance to this bank is inside a larger entranceway. It was probably overlooked. Things are different at the Comets Bank. A real pigsty, filthy, forlorn and empty. The vaults have all been broken into, as well as the deposit boxes. Boxes and cases have been slit open and trampled. There's human excrement everywhere. The place stinks. We flee. The Deutsche Bank looks halfway decent. Two men are busying themselves sweeping the floor. The safes have been cleaned out, but very neatly, obviously opened using the keys from the bank. One of the men tells me how they had got hold of the director's home address and raced off with a truck to get him. When they arrived they found him dead, along with his wife and daughter, poisoned. Without wasting time, they drove straight to the deputy director and demanded that he unlock the vaults. This bank has even opened for business. A sign states that the teller will receive deposits from 1 to 3 p.m. I'd like to see who's interested in making a deposit right now. The old-fashioned stocking or mattress method strikes me as decidedly more secure. I can't quite figure out why the Russians burrowed their way into the banks like that with such determination. Surely their orders did not include this sort of brutal safe-cracking. That's clear from the bank where the boxes were so ruthlessly smashed open, and from the overwhelming faecal stench left by the robbers. It's possible the looters had been taught that banks in this country are the bulwarks of the evil capitalists, so that by plundering them they were performing a kind of expropriation of the expropriators, a deed worthy of praise and celebration. But it doesn't add up. This looks more like sheer, unbridled looting, each man for himself, boldly snatching whatever he can. I'd like to ask the sub-lieutenant about it, but don't dare. A big cleaning operation is underway in the Städtische Sparkasse. Two elderly women are scrubbing the floor. There are no vaults here. As far as we can see, the tills are completely empty. The lieutenant promises to send a guard tomorrow. But what is there to guard? We spend a good while searching in vain for the Credit und Bodenbank. At last we find it in a back courtyard, 
safe and sound, peacefully slumbering away like Sleeping Beauty, behind a folding security grating. I ask around in the building, and eventually...